me to be here because this is where I studied all the all the basics of uh, this is where I studied all the basics of what you know uh, teachers like him teach us uh, about every single element that he said you know so you will find every single element in this film of the inciting incident the catalyst the first the plot point the second third you know the like what uh, Blake Snyder in Save the Cat says, you know, Dark Knight of the Soul, you know, just before he is about to make love to Persis, that is his Dark Knight of the Soul. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely moralistic Dark Knight of the Soul. The conflict is not at that moment from outside. It is his own moral conflict that I cannot lie to this girl whom I love so much. Because she, ultimately this whole film is all about Chetan trying to find that girl. You know, he is nobody. If you see, the whole film is really camouflaged in so many other elements of conflict, but it is a, ultimately, to me, it's, it's an extremely gentle, delicate uh, love story. Because the first shot is on him and the second shot is on her. And we end the whole film on them, you know, on the same two close-ups. The beautiful relationship between them and the constant flux that he feels as to who he is. So, yeah, all these elements are there. And yet, uh, uh, because you and I are professional screenwriting you know, people, we can see them. But our aim was obviously to completely sort of, you know, overwrite them. And so, in a way, so many moments become plot points. In a way, so many moments become dark night of the soul, you know. It's like a, it's like a 2D force. Now, why is this possible is because and straight away getting to the point, you know, why is this possible? Because this film, as far as we were concerned, me and my writer, this is not an artificial um, conflict, you know. It's not a fiction occurring outside of life. When you have a fiction occurring outside of life, you probably have to really uh, uh, fall back to the to the structure more often, because because. But here, when we were writing it, although I knew all the rules of screenwriting, I was I was not even consciously following it. It was not necessary because almost every scene was pushing the things forward. You know, just the simple thing that Mayank looks at her uh, at the girl's and the camera goes down on her is a very strong uh, 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 plot movement. You know, it's 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 we get to know about this character whom we like and, and hate at the same time, you know. And so there is constantly, but very beautifully, like he said, that it still has all those inner workings, you know, like an internal architecture of that whole story, you know, how the character arc grows from, from what he is and what he becomes. Uh, so, yeah. Why don't you talk a little bit about just how it came to be from, because obviously you were involved in every step of the way, so maybe talk about inception and completion. Oh yeah, I mean, something like this, you know, um, you, you probably get to make it, I don't know, once in five years, once in ten years. It's a very highly personal story with extremely personal uh, style of making, you know. Like, some of you might think that, yeah, I like the whole film, it was very nice, but the, the animation was probably not necessary. But what is necessary? You know, it's a very big question. You cannot convert this whole beautiful art form into an entirely uh, industrial engineering machine. Ultimately, the greatest moments of cinema are the most poignant and the most personal, you know. There are many scenes in Lawrence of Arabia which you could argue are not necessary. They don't move the story forward. Are you saying that the continuous four-minute shot of a person coming in 400 mm lens from the far distance of the desert is not moving the story forward? Well, technically it is not. But poetically, it is one of the greatest shots of cinematic history. And it is a high obsession of the director, as well as, just like he said, you know, the, the, terri the terrifying obsession of the boy in finding, uh, trying to win this competition, at the same time trying to find his voice and trying to find his moralistic core. So all of this really, I uh, wanted to live, but I could not because when I was 16 and when I went to this film school, uh, sorry, this, this uh, college, 
uh, I wanted to write, but they said, you're a kid, you don't know how to write, you know, and we get these bigger sort of, you know, it's like your teacher directing your student film. That's how it happens there, you know, in that college. And what's the point? How will you learn? And but it's very prestigious, it's like BAFTAs or Oscars for these young kids. And uh, they said, oh, no, you can't write, you're just a kid. And so I left, and then I pursued a, 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 a career in films. So that voiceless moment always remained inside me. And it's funny that about three years back I attended a workshop. Although I'm a I'm a hundred percent practicing filmmaker all the time, I all the time uh, uh, want to learn because the more you learn, the more you teach. The more you teach, the more you learn. It's like a constant process, you know. So nobody really uh, in creativity, you know, that cycle has to be continuous. So I just went for this very small workshop, and that director, I mean, she didn't even she hadn't even made a film in her own life, you know. But that didn't deter me. I simply went there like, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I just make these little documentaries and this and that. And I just sat there in the corner. You know? And she told us to write an exercise uh, in one very great epic Indian uh, story, which is called Ramayan, in which she said, write the story from the point of view of Sita. That's the, the female character, which is a very voiceless character. And while scribbling, I wrote a note, you know, voiceless moment. And she said, try to find that voiceless moment from your own life. And that's how I went back five years, eight years, ten years, twelve years. And then I said, oh my God, when I was 16, I had this terrible voiceless moment in my life, which I could never recover. Because I really wanted to write that play. Because if you could write and win, you would get the best girl in the college. <laughs> and at 16 or 17 or 18, that's like the loss of a lifetime, you know, it's like, it could change, it did change the course of my life, you know. So that's just the note remained and then I sort of, you know, went back and started doing research. And the terrible practice of getting an outside director to stage a play still continues unabated. It's, it's bizarre, you know, it's like an open secret, but everybody does it. So that was the key thing for me, you know. Yes. The, the whole point is you want to tell personal stories, but yes, but they should be also for me, especially from a country I come from, like India. Uh, we have to have this social commitment. We cannot just make pure entertainment. At least I can't, because I can see so many issues, you know. The terrible poverty, the terrible fascism, the terrible obsession with, you know, things and, uh, and the artificiality of life, you know, and the aspiration to become somebody through winning things. So all of these issues do bother me all the time. They do bother me here, you know, when I'm seeing here right now what's happening in America where it's like the whole country, you know, it's right now like a TV show, you know. But <laughs> it's, it's like, it's our lives, you know. I'm, I'm partially American because I've studied here, I, you know, I fell in love here and so many things. So I do feel sad, you know, when they are here, fascism is an extremely dangerous thing and that's how, that's how we have had first World War One, World War Two, and the Holocaust, you know, because we thought that ah, it's not affecting us. It is. All of this fascism in every form, whether in Purushottam theater competition or in the national elections of America or everywhere, they are deeply affecting our lives, and we must stand against it. That was my 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 impetus. That was my interest in this story. So there's people in the room have written four or five scripts, and some have written three, two, some haven't written any, they're just getting started. So you co-wrote this with someone. Can you talk about that process, how you approached it? Well, uh, after after having studied and learned, you know, screenwriting for years, I don't know, for 15, well, yeah, I mean, 15 years I've been learning and I have read every kind of book. I've studied it here, you know, from Blake Snyder, Save the Cat, to Seed Fields, you know, original, like, you know, famous 82 book you know, and all of that, you know, and then I realized that if you go out on the field and, uh, you know, I don't know, if you're in Afghanistan, if you're in Pakistan, your life is on the line every single scene. Where is the question of plot point and turning point? Every bloody scene is a turning point. Everything is turning, you know. Yeah, when you're working in pure, uh, I don't know, romantic fiction like uh, dark, uh, the, the film the Dark Grey's, which trailer we saw? The, the famous uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, you know? So Fifty Shades of Grey or the Fifty Shades of Darker. 
See, it's not social. You know, the stakes are, there are no social stakes, you know. So when you are working on those scripts, you need a tremendous attention to your plot points and blah, 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 because you are basically working in artificial zone. You know, they are basically hyper real sort of, you know, kind of characters and melodramatic. But when you are really working on real films, uh, sorry, real subjects, it's much, much more, much more different approach. You know, because every, in fact, we had to remove some scenes which were so over, and they were exhausting, like the basketball scene. The original scene was like 12 minutes. The way he completely breaks down the young boy was so terrifying, and we had to pull it down to three and a half minutes. All the love scene, you know, when he goes to Nora in that whole forest, you know, in that whole fantasy scene, that was also very, that was also extremely deeper erotic. But then we thought people will not come out of it, you know. They'll be like, they'll have so much more over emotional uh, feeling that, you know, so we had to like control them, in fact, here. So in this film, especially to, to answer it very, like, you know, clearly, is that when you have a subject which is so potent, with so much madness, with so much obsession, with so much, like, you know, craze, then it's probably much easier to focus on the scenes, the actors, the shooting, and emotions, rather than worrying too much, are we really falling on the right page? Is the turning point coming at exactly at the page 10? You know, is, so, yeah, so those worries were really left behind, I think, right in the first couple of weeks, as soon as we finished the treatment. Because we knew we have more scenes which are conflicting, you know, and which are very, very, like, you know, powerful than we need. So we were really free, you know. So you, so you outlined, you created a treatment, and then yes. an outline, and then did you physically work together, or would you write, and then show it to your co-writer, or no. vice versa? Or? Yeah, I often, I always work together with my writer, co-writer, always. Excuse me. So we always sit in a room, and the way we write is, we don't type actual scenes. We just talk. We discuss. Just like we are discussing now, you know. And we come to the moments where we are able to push the boundaries. How these two people in one particular room can push it. So once we reach that emotional point, we enact it. Me and my co-writer, we enact that scene. And that depletes our energy so much that then after that, for like two hours, we are just sitting there like this. You know? <laughs> Like the moment when Chetan holds Persis, you know, and pulls her together, you know, in the hospital, if you remember, you know. And it's also that shot is also in the trailer. It's, you think that it's very easy to shoot, it's not. Because, you know, what is problem with us, all of us, is that in real life, we are extremely simple, docile, happy. We want extreme gentleness in our life. But at the same time, we have to be bipolar because when it comes to writing the script and directing, we have to be extremely intense. You know what I mean? You can't come back home and start, you know, beating everybody in the house. You can't be like Mayank when you're home because you will not have a life. But how do you reach those moments of Mayank and Chetan's madness? So you enact it in a zone where there is nobody. You don't have your mother, you don't have your wife, sister, nobody during that time, you know, from morning 10 to whatever, 9 that we work. So we enact it. We reach those mad zones and we like, you know. So I still remember we we found this moment where he holds her and, and my writer held me. You know, I said, okay, I'm Persis and, and my writer held me and he was this close to me and I was so scared, you know, looking into his eyes. And he has big beautiful eyes and I was like and you know, so you have to reach those moments, you have to actually live them. So gone are the paper days, you know. Scripts cannot only be written on paper. You have to absolutely, you know, enact them for yourself. So you can reach the truths of those moments. So you can contribute to the director if you are not the director by saying, no, you have to reach on a scale of 1 to 10, you have to bloody reach 11. And yet it should not distort, you know, because otherwise everything will look stupid and idiotic, you know, because it has to be consistent. So yes, that's how we sort of, you know, developed each scene and we took the notes, emotional notes. This is what is going to happen. Then it's very important. If you are a director-producer, then you can have that choice. Is that I casted the actors at the 
at the treatment level. I got them in. I started discussing the scenes with them. I gave them the cues. So beginning and end is fixed. It's like Kranti is going to walk into here and he's going to after whatever after a certain time he's going to walk out with him. What happens in between, I didn't tell them. So then they were able to explore those journeys. And we were surprised how similar uh, uh, me and my writer had thought and how the outcome was similar but so beautiful. Because you see, if I'm going to walk out with Tim after a certain time from this room, the conflict between him and me can only be, you know, to a certain level because the end is fixed. But how do you reach there? I, we, let it to, uh, we, we left it to the actors. And my God, the things that they discovered, like the basketball scene, it was unbelievable. Some moments that they came up with, oof, you couldn't have written it. So you have to also, as screenwriters, you have to really work with your actors, if you can. My best advice to myself is, because I don't think I can give advice to anybody, it is such a personal uh, journey. You know? It's like, how can you tell somebody how to write a poem? But I can advise myself that the first thing I always do is I write a scene and I catch hold of a person who is an actor and I just enact with him and I know it's going to work because you know I'm writing it with integration of that human being and that person. Yes, you have any questions? And then I'll tell you one line connected to this. Then if you're working with big stars, you know, which I have worked with Harvey Keitel and I'm hoping to work with another big star soon, then they won't ask you the classic question on the set, uh, what's my motivation? <laughs> because when they ask you some, a question like this, you're dead. Because you haven't prepared it. Because you've all the time worked on the page. And the agreements happen and everything happened and you're suddenly on the set with this big star and he has not gone through the same process that you have gone through. So he asked you, wait a minute. Just before the take, there are 200 people waiting and he says to you, Grandi, I, what's my motivation here? And you're like, come on. Like, you had four months to go through the script. We're asking me this question now? So better work with him four months back, you know. You don't work with actors at the end. That's the biggest mistake a lot of young filmmakers, I think, do, you know. You have to work with them from day one. And literally do all the, like Sidney Lumet, you know, his, his, uh, his beautiful um, you know, poster is here, you know. Uh, Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. Mm -hmm. He made that film when he was 77. And it is one of the best films. Because he kept on rediscovering himself. And that is, you know, why it became such a great film at 77. Because he developed it with his actors. He asked them that, would you kill your parents? And they were like, and that is that film. They couldn't say that, no, are you crazy? They were like, and that's that film, you know. Questions, anybody? Yes, please. Uh, thanks so much for showing us your film. It was really, really a lot of fun. Uh, it sounds like it was a whole series of discoveries and exploration from like writing to casting and putting it all together. Was there any moment or scene that from the very beginning, you're like, this is gonna happen? I imagine the voiceless scene at the beginning where it's completely silent for the few shots. But was there anything else where you're like, this is going to happen no matter what everybody says, this scene's going to be in the movie? Uh, many scenes were like that because they hold things together, you know. Like Chetan had to rebel against uh, against the, 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 the professor, you know. He had to rebel. So the basketball scene was there. But it was not really uh, so pronounced. So, you know, so really nothing really much happens, you know. And yet, a lot happens, you know, and his just actions are extremely disturbing. We didn't expect them to be like that. So, yes, there were certain scenes, like especially, uh, I, I, in fact, to be very honest, 70% of the scenes were locked. It, it, so, in a sense, you can't move them because, like he said, right after the screening, the character arc, the plot point one, two, three, and the climax, all, if it is not there, it will all fall apart, you know, it will all look meaningless. So all of those scenes were basically locked. It is the 20% scenes which we improvised within the structure that was more poetic. So the basketball scene, then the voiceless moments, you know, of those people, when he taps into his own father's voiceless moment, that was his real father's story. Yeah, but 
the voiceless moment was written. So the scene was written that all three of them will talk about voiceless moments and Chetan will sort of, you know, first seem comic and stupid and then it will turn out that he's actually much smarter than we thought. Because he thinks that Persis lied and we don't know whether Persis lied or not. Because Mayan sort of, you know, almost presents it like a, like a, like a show, you know, about his own father and mother. So it's very complex. It is constantly in a flux. Like, because they are actors, you know. And you never know when the actor is crying, whether it is real or not, whether it is acting or not. You know, it's very tough. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? Anybody? Yeah. I had one about the, um, I tried to follow it, and, and then I got to a point where I was like, I couldn't figure it out, so I just, um, I just watched it, but the, how there was the English being spoken, and then they would ask the question in English, but then they would answer it in Indian, and vice versa sometimes, and it just seems kind of like a mix. Was there a reason? Well, to be very honest, uh, that's how Indians speak. Oh, really? Yeah. There are some Indians here, you know, and you can ask them. In, in India, like, you can, you can look at me, you know, I, I'm speaking very fluent English because English is my national language. Right. But my mother tongue is Marathi, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it's, that's how we speak, you know. And I, I, I knew that it's, I'm taking a risk, you know, constantly switching between Hindi and English, Hindi, you know, and French and this and that. But I really wanted to just be the way it is, you know. And not worry too much that, you know, no, let's not sort of, you know. Because I thought that, you know, in terms of the sound harmony, I wanted to give a different sonic experience. You know, because what happens is, if you see, there is also sonic. Cinema is also sonic. It's also what we hear. And if we start hearing the same kind of, you know, thing, it's like the same frequency. And I wanted to break that. So, you know, you are, so therefore you are, you were challenged, you know, in a way. You were constantly challenged. Oh, why are they shifting between two things, you know? So in a way, I'm happy that, you know, you were not completely in just a pure consumeristic mm, uh, position, you know, that you're just consuming the film and, okay, fine, yeah, nice, popcorn, let's go home, you know, let's, yeah. let's leave it at that. Because I wanted to give you experience of Indian English as well as Indian Hindi. It's also knowing different cultures, you know, through sound. Cool. Other questions? Yeah. How did you make such a dark subject so bloody entertaining? <laughs> I was laughing through the entire film. Yeah, yeah. Was it like a conscious, I mean, because, you know, when you tap a subject like this, it's not supposed to go this route, but it was so entertaining. The humor was so, you know, it was, it was really entertaining. Yeah. I mean, I shouldn't say this, but it is so funny. Usually at Khan Festival, you know, uh, uh, they they are very uh, they don't normally take films which are not uh, French co-productions. But a very senior person there, I shall name him. He said, "We love your film, but it is so entertaining, and so therefore it will be so difficult to program." You know, I'm like, what? No entertaining films allowed. So yes, you know what I mean. I was shocked to hear this, but I I was fine. You know, I said, "Yeah, I mean, I understand because you need." You know, you need a, you need a more sort of, you know, see, even within art house cinema, there is a conformism, which we have to break, you know. We all know. We all lie to ourselves. You know, we go to festivals, we see films, and then we sometimes don't like them, but we quietly come back home and we just say to ourselves that... <laughs> but, so just like we criticize commercial cinema, which is, which is, there is also a certain kind of you know, art house mood and art house cinema which I wanted to question and break the mold. Why, why can't you mix all these genres together? You know, it's actually easy only if somebody allows you and only if you are ready to practice it. Because if you see, how can you define, is it romance? Not entirely. Drama? Not entirely. Comedy? Yes. Towards the end, it's, uh, towards the end, it becomes so dialectic. You know, the whole dance sequence and this and that. It, it, it is not even theater anymore. It's not even cinema anymore. And all the boundaries of cinema and theater, as well as the dance, they all merge, and we don't know what the hell is going on anymore. So you, you yeah, that's that was our approach. And to be very honest, uh, I learned to write comedy uh, while I was in UCLA. Yeah, yeah. 
because there was there are proper classes here, you know, how to write a comedy, <laughs> you know, and things like that. So if you notice it in America, well, most of you are Americans, but this is for her, you will see that even in simple talk, you know, people talk very in a funny way, you know, in a in a in a very friends style, you know. Because everybody here is a screenwriter, aspiring screenwriter, and they all want to make funny line. They all want to constantly pep. And I was not afraid of using that in the film, you know. Well, of course, but it was uniquely Indian. And I don't know, maybe, you know, like mixture of everything, American, French, Indian, you know. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? Yeah. So, um, if I'm remembering correctly, you studied film, right? So, like, all the directoral choices you made of, like, crossing from one age to one and all of that. Everything is planned, yeah. Purposeful, right? Purposeful. So, um, you kind of did, and what I loved about the movie is that you did that story-wise, but you also did it cinematically, and I thought it was beautiful and well, very well done. And you've also studied Brecht, because that scene about the, the juxtaposition of comedy and drama, when he says that, you know, I had to follow the dramatic scene with this funny story. Yeah. I was like, exactly. you studied theater too. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that was, yeah, 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 I, so beautiful appreciation, thank you. Yes, I mean, this film is really, is born out of uh, 15 years of all the studies of cinema, French films, American films, everything, you know, including, you know, like uh, uh, all, all, the, all the directors that I love, you know, so it's like a very subtle homage to them too, you know, like there is this moment when he, it's a very David Lynch kind of moment when he walks into that forest, you know, yeah. and it's very inexplicable. And he walks into this woman and she's like sitting there and she seems like Persis and is the, what is this? Like is this double role? Is she a prostitute? Is she a figment of his imagination? You know, why do we have to explain everything? When we see Mulholland Drive, you know, even today I am amazed that, wow, you know. So, yeah, I mean, yes, I agree that uh, we've used all those elements to, to, to form the story. Yeah, we were lucky that we, we, uh, we, you know, uh, Escaped. <laughs> we finally, like, you know, the film held, you know? Yeah. It doesn't look like, what is this? You know? Cool. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, the nun scene? <laughs> <laughs> See? Yeah. Exactly. Now, now, it's a very beautiful point. Yeah. Nun sequence. Only this line was written that he goes about uh, asking questions about how to write the best play. But we did not know what would be the outcome. So the whole masturbation uh, uh, question that he asks, which are so irrelevant and therefore stupid, you know, and obviously <laughs> stupid and therefore comic, you know, and comic and therefore art, because comedy is also a very higher form of art. You know what I mean, like Buster Keaton, from Buster Keaton till today, you know. So, uh, but it's also very deeply rooted in the whole sacrilegious, you know, sh he being, she being a nun, asking about what is your standard masturbation <laughs> like it's so so bizarre you know so we didn't know the outcome of it and we just went along and it was extremely scary and enjoyable because we were thinking that these and they were all real writers and we thought that they might just kick us out of their house <laughs> but we actually told them on phone that we are making a documentary on bbc mm. and some of them didn't recognize that the boy was a boy because you don't See, right now, if I walk in as a woman, why would you suspect? You know, you have no reason because you have no pre-story. You think that ah, he looks like a, yeah, he looks a little bit like a boyish, but he's a <laughs> nice woman. <laughs> so, so you know, so he, when he walked into the room as a nun, nobody, nobody suspected him. <laughs> That's great. That's a great sequence in the film too, and and it endears him to us even more, um, which what makes him a great character. But uh, I must add that it's very difficult in India uh, to to clear two or three scenes. You know, it's impossible. Like that nun sequence, yeah. the censor board of India will never clear it. They say that you did you mute the word masturbation. Why? Because it would hurt Christian people's sentiments if it's a nun asking this. The second scene is when she pulls the pad out, you know, when she pulls her pad out and as a protest, you know, uh, they say that, no, you know, just blur that pad. <laughs> I say, but, but what about the rest of the action? I say, yeah, I mean, scenes are insisting, you know, but, but first of all, review that scene or just blur that pad, you know. 
And I'm like, but it's not my choice. The girl did it. The actress did it. It's a, that woman did it. So it is woman's empowerment scene, you know. And there were women sitting in the censor board. So it's not like America. The fight we have had to do there is totally different. In America, it is voluntary. In there, no. Every film has to be cleared by the censor board. And some people who, those five people, we would never meet again in life. We don't even know their names. But our whole life, you know, three years of our life, we put in a film and they come and they say, oh, these. So they, originally when the, the committee saw the film, they deleted 22 scenes. Every single scene that was crossing the boundary was, there was a list of 22 scenes. So I felt sick. I immediately had a mild heart attack right in that meeting. <laughs> I was taken out in the car by my assistant and I was put on a drip because I said, I'm dead. <laughs> you know, and I was depressed for two months. So we applied for a higher committee. And so, yeah, so we like, kept on fighting for four or five months. We still have to fight more. But so far they have cleared some, you know, it's very bizarre. Like they have cleared the love scene. You know, uh, but they are very adamant on uh, nun sequence where the nun shouldn't say the word masturbation. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, it's just a it's just a scientific word. <laughs> no. So yeah, I'm still fighting, and I will fight. I'm pretty adamant, you know, just like they are, and just like the boy Chetan is. I will make sure that this film is 99% released in its original form. Yeah, that's great. Yes. Uh, do you have an answer? In for yourself of like who Chatham is at the end when he says I'm not from that town? What a beautiful question. Because, you know, we have built this humanity and we have built our nations on identities, you know. Not really purely on love. Not really purely on, on emotions. So we constantly ask each other, what is your religion? What is your caste? What, which country are you from? And we do all the all kind of racial profiling, you know. And based on the skin tone, based on the height, based on size, we have found different ways and multiple ways of hating each other, of separating each other. And then we are left alone. And then uh, we create this whole literature and cinema of alienation. We created this world. We are contributing to it, you know. And so Chetan's character was, was a, a sign for me to ask this question to myself and the audience. Does it matter, you know, where he's from? Does it matter what his name is? Does it matter what his face and skin is, you know? And I wanted to deliberately cast the most average looking boy. I am average looking and I'm very happy and proud of it. <laughs> I don't look like the film stars of India, you know? I mean, you can't have film stars in India like Dustin Hoffman. You need to, like, really, they, are, they all look like tall, handsome, you know, amazing looking, you know. And dark skin, dark skin is not allowed in India as stars and, hero and as heroes and heroines, which is so sad. So I wanted to question every bloody, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, this kind of, you know, conformist approach. That this is how a heroine should look. This is how a hero should look. No, I said, find me the most simplest boy. And let's work with him because he has the magic. Because all of us have that magic, you know. But but the system we have created is so so dangerous for us, you know. We have left no scope for ourselves. And then we leave one somebody up there and we all look at him, you know, we are all saying, yeah. I really love those, you know, Homer, Homer uh, the Simpsons serials because they really have such poignant and such beautiful comments on such things, you know, about life and conditioning. I remember one, one, one very old uh, episode, you know, where one, one a former pop star has come to that little town to live and people are just not letting her be because she was a former pop star. And she's like, but I just want to be. And at one point they had loved her so much and therefore at one point now they all decide to hate her. You know what I mean? So we have trapped our whole humanity in identities. And that was our point at the end. You know, Does it matter who he is from where he is? Because we have actually experienced him. Will you take him for what he is? Instead of from where he comes from. Whether he comes from Mexico, Uganda, India, LA, where does it matter? You know? Do we have to create these different worlds? White world, brown world, black world, why? 
So it was like an amalgamation of all of that. And then she asked the last question, what is your name? You've been with this whole person for these two hours, you know. And, you know, who are you? And in a way, we go so close on her that, you know, that she, she's, she's so open to who he is. So she is the girl he always wanted. She is the love I personally always wanted. I is that would accept me. So is there a social media outlet that people can link to and help yes, you out? Yes, with of course, of course. Film? Yeah, uh, on, on Twitter it is CRD the film. But I don't use Twitter. I opened Twitter just yesterday. I'm very... <laughs> <laughs> and because the film is releasing on 4th, you know, somebody here like who's handling my marketing and all that, she said, you got to have Twitter. Open Twitter. I said, what is Twitter? <laughs> but anyway, I have a Facebook uh, CRD page, you know. I have my page, Kranti Kanade, and CRD film, Facebook page, on which I'm pretty much, you know, very, very active. Like, you know, I, I love to interact on that. So please do like that page. Interact. Post all your comments, you know, because you are 50 of them. And if you post even two lines, four lines, good, bad, whatever you like, would really help. Because this is how we will build communities, you know. Otherwise, uh, others will decide what content we are going to see. Yes, this will, you know, whether Netflix or any, any other, you know, media, let not them decide what we see. Let us participate in creating this whole film community of what all of us should see. And that's when the diversity will come in. And then one day, you know, hopefully the color won't matter. You know? well, thank you, Carl. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you all next week. I must, I must uh, apologize because my whole conversation suddenly, I don't know why, became very spiritual. And the, film, <laughs> the film actually is very funny and very topical. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. <laughs>